Greetings, friends, and welcome to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. When we consider the writings of the rabbis, including the Mishnah, the Midrash, and the Talmud, we often forget that they existed within specific cultural contexts. Chazal, as they are often referred to, did not write in a vacuum, but were attuned and responsive to ideas and literature of their surrounding societies. Today, we will explore one of these contexts, namely the Greco-Roman sphere, and ask ourselves to ask ourselves to what extent Greek ideas, styles, and concerns influenced rabbinic literature as we have it today. Our guest today to discuss these topics is Dr. Simon Goldhill, Professor of Greek Literature and Culture at Cambridge University and Director of Studies in Classics at King's College, Cambridge. One of England's great classicists, he is a fellow both of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also a member of the British Academy. While much of his scholarship focuses on Greek literature and its reception, he has also made fascinating contributions to the world of Jewish studies. And it is these ideas that I hope to discuss with him today. It is a pleasure to welcome him to the podcast of Jewish Ideas. Professor Goldhill, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Nice to be here too. Excellent, excellent. Uh, all the way from Cambridge. Thank you for joining us. Um, so I would like to start with a brief quote from an abstract of one of the, your papers on the subject, in which you define the rabbinic corpus as one of the largest and most complex corpus of material from late antiquity that discusses religious experience. I found that a very interesting description because one doesn't really find very often the rabbinic corpus, let's say, of all these rabbinic writings uh, placed in the context of the sort of literature that classicists usually uh, talk about. So could you perhaps elaborate on this description? What is the place of rabbinic writings in the classical world? Okay, to do this, we need two moments of background. The first one is that the rabbis have a deeply vested interest in denying their connection to Hellenism. This goes back most famously to the rabbinical reconstruction of the notion of Hanukkah, in which the Jews fight against Greek dominance of culture and win. Now, both of those points are uh, relevant. Firstly, Greek culture was absolutely dominant in the Roman world to the extent that when Caesar is murdered, he didn't say et tu brute, as we have in Latin from Shakespeare. He said kai su pai, and you too, child, in Greek. The moment of crisis, the Roman emperor spoke Greek as his natural language to speak. And that was typical across the elite of the Roman world. So to be in the elite of the Roman world, to have any contact to government, to have any space, you had to speak Greek, you had to be trained in Greek. And what's fascinating is that all our basic sources for Hanukkah are written in Greek. We say we conquered the Greek spirit, we conquered the Greek to become Jews, but what we did is we write it all down in Greek. That's not much of a cultural victory, right? That's an important part of background. You can see immediately how we're going to be lying about how Greek we are from beginning to end, okay? It's a very important point. The second point is to remember is that the rabbinical tradition as we have it starts quite late. It starts after really the uh, fall of the temple and even then some years later. Before it gets written down, of course, it's the fourth century. And before it gets written down, even later, that's the Jerusalem, the Midrash, uh, the, the Mishnah, I beg your pardon. And then later, of course, the Babylonian Talmud is not until the sixth century. Now, these texts go back earlier, but how earlier is a question. And what you have to remember is there is the period before the destruction of the temple that Jews normally call the second temple period. But I will call it Hellenistic Judaism for the moment. Let's say it's Jewish life that is obviously focused not just in Israel, in fact, barely in Israel, but mainly in Alexandria. Alexandria at the time had the biggest Jewish community in the world. It's a Greek-speaking city. And most of the Jews there spoke Greek rather than they spoke Hebrew. It's in the Alexandrian city that the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, is, is written. And for the next 500 years, that is the liturgical text for most Jews. We forget that in synagogue and in discussion, many Jews for 500 years, were speaking Greek, reading Greek, and learning Greek. And that Hebrew really was not a major language. It comes back into fashion, comes back into work through the rabbis, but most of the ordinary people were speaking Aramaic, and the majority of what we would call educated Jews, elite Jews, are doing their business, they're living their life, what they do in synagogue is done in Greek. So the extent that the most, one of the most learned and best published Jews of the period, one Philo of Alexandria, left a huge number of texts, most of them interpretations of the Hebrew Bible, most people think he didn't speak Hebrew at all. Right? So he writes about the Bible in Greek, discusses it in Greek. So that gives a general flavor of the background, that when the rabbis come along, 
they're going to have to make their own world. They're going to have to discuss how they're going to create that world of rabbinical authority. And it takes many centuries for it to become established. And one of the ways they do it is by refusing to write like Greeks, refusing to write in Greek, demanding that people don't learn Greek, to suggest that learning Greek is some form of heresy, famous quotation that you'll know from the Talmud that when can I learn Greek? Well, it says you should study Torah day and night, so find a place that is not day and night, and then you can discuss, discuss Greek, right? Um, that's the attempt to say we should never learn Greek. But this is an aggressive separatist gesture by rabbis against the community in which they're living. In your estimation, is it because of this aggressive move by the rabbis that, the, as you would say, the uh, Greco or Hellenistic Jewish civilization dies down? Because at a certain point, the Alexandrian community, which, as you, as you mentioned, was massive, it was magnificent. The rabbis describe the, the synagogue of Alexandria in you know, massive palatial terms. Mm. Um, and was it, this, was it the, the, the rabbis and their influence, the kind of literature that they were, um, they were writing, was that responsible for the decline or did it simply happen at the same time? No, I don't think so. I think, first of all, the Alexandrian community carried on speaking Greek long after the rabbis. Greek is, a, after all, a language that has been unbrokenly spoken till now. So the Greek community in Greece speaks Greek. After all, there are many, there are not so many Jews now, but there was a big community in Thessaloniki then before the, the Holocaust. And so that, that's a continuity. What happens is two things. First of all, the rabbis gradually gain a certain degree of authority, particularly in their own circles. And in those circles, Hebrew starts to become dominant and people start to study more. They start to learn more. And for those purposes, they start to forget, as it were, to study Greek in the same way. On the other hand, you've also got to remember that certain Jews who wrote Greek became rather tricky for the Jews. I'm talking about Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, Paul, oh, right? Yes. <laughs> so You're right. Those were good Jews. Yeah, those sort of Jews who were coming along, who turned out to be the origins of Christianity, caused a good deal of problems for the Jews. And so writing in Greek was not so fashionable after Christianity got going, because it looks as though you're, you're getting caught up in the wrong sort of world. So that's, a, that's the other side of it. It's not just Hellenistic Judaism, but also the rise of Christianity that uh, is associated so strongly with Greek. I mean, the Gospels, after all, are written only in Greek um, to start with, as is St. Paul. And that means that Jews tended to just avoid Greek for a while if they wished to remain under the rabbinical authority. Fascinating. Um, and, and so you, you mentioned before that you know, the rabbis did have some um, within their corpus, they do reflect some negative attitude towards the Greeks, as you mentioned, you know, learning Greek wisdom at a time which is not day and not night, etc. Um, but at the same time, you also have within rabbinic literature some uh, praises of, of Greek culture or uh, Greek wisdom, Greek music, occasionally the Greek language as well. Um, and this is this is curious to me because it's clear there wasn't one monolithic attitude, sort of a regnant anti anti Greek push. That there seems to have been conflicting, ambivalent attitudes. What, what do you make of this? Well, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the first thing is, of course, even within the text themselves, we're told that Rabbi Gamaliel had 500 students learning Greek so they could speak to the authorities. And you've already recognized that if you just learn Hebrew, you have no possibility of engaging with the outside world. Some rabbis were very happy with that thought of not engaging with the outside world, as we have today, some rabbis who are like that, all right? But we also know that there are a lot of Jews who actually are engaged in the outside world. And for them, Greek was normality. One of the most telling moments for me is a little midrash that occurs on the Akedah, where it said, uh, it said, how do we know that Isaac was willing to be sacrificed? It's a question. How could the old man of Ram actually take Isaac and put him on the altar? What is going on? How could he force somebody onto the altar and tie him up? So, well, no, Isaac was willing to do so. How do we know that? Because it says in the text, Isaac said, where is the sacrifice that we're going to offer? Where is the Allah? And uh, Avram says, Hashem will provide hasse, the goat, the sheep, the, the animal. Yeah? In Greek, se means you. And they say, there you go. It means Isaac knew it was him. And they treat that as hasse, the you. And they just take that straight the way through. It's a bilingual pun. And that Midrash explains that's how we know that Isaac was willing to be sacrificed because it says se. Now, that is showing you that people who are reading this are quite comfortable with certain levels of Greek. Whatever they say about whether you learn it or not, they still understand the joke. They see what's going on. I mean, joke, wordplay, 
It's a very important word play. And we have other examples of that with Greek and Latin going through in very, very interesting, in very interesting ways. And so you can see that the rabbis are actually, they know more Greek than they're letting on. And that's quite important. That lets us see the way in which it's not just a, a faint memory, but you can see as if you like the ideological struggle of the rabbis to make their community and to try and keep it pure. Something we may well recognize from today also. Oh, absolutely. Um, and it's, uh, of course, one could argue that um, many centuries later, Maimonides almost had his revenge uh, on those rabbis. Uh, <laughs> well, unwittingly. Let's by, get back to Aristotle. Indeed, indeed. But... Exactly. By, by, by placing yes, yeah. uh, <laughs> new European forms of philosophy at the center of the Jewish religion. Yeah. Um, yeah a wonderful kind of revenge indeed. Um, okay. So, so I mean, you've, you've written quite a bit on this topic and you have uh, one of your central theses that you have posted in your papers is that you've claimed that the literature of the rabbis constitutes a kind of resistance um, to Greco-Roman -for forms of literature. Um, and, you know, could you elaborate on this? What were the strains of, of Greco-Roman, again, ideas or attitudes that they were, uh, they were opposing, they were resisting, and in what ways did they seek to do so? Okay. Let me give you just one simple example to start with, and that's the notion of biography. Okay. OK, now, when you read the Talmud, you see that there are literally hundreds of stories about particular rabbis. Now, with these rabbis, these stories are scattered throughout the Talmud. There is no suggestion that they should be put together as a coherent narrative of a life. They're occasionally cross-referenced. He said it here. What does it mean? Does it relate to something we can see over here? We get those cross-references, but not in terms of biological explanation, biographical explanation. We get no explanations in the Talmud that go, because he'd been brought up this way, he thought that way. That's just not a Talmudic way of exploring the life of a person. You get very little moments. Maybe you would say he was an Amha Aretz for 40 years and then became a rabbi. But his decisions, his thought is not influenced by the fact that he was an Amha Aretz, or not barely influenced in that way. And that's a fairly rare example. For most rabbis, we have very little explanation of, as it were, a growth into a personality, a growth into a character. Why is that important? Because in both Greek and Roman culture, there is an extended discourse of autobiography and biography. People wrote life histories of great men. And the great men were, we are told, where they're born, where they come from, and in what ways we can learn from their childhood about what the man is going to be, how they have a coherent ambition, and how we can then judge them as people through their lives. Typically, Plutarch, who writes in Greek and writes about Romans and Greeks. He will give you two paired biographies and will compare two men. And at the end, he'll do what he calls a syncrasis, a comparison that says, well, Caesar was better than Alexander in this, but Alexander was better than Caesar in that. And in each case, we get what we would recognize in modern terms as a biography. Similarly, Christians write hagiography. They write lives of saints, which are not quite so interesting to most of us as the Greek biographies, because they tend to be rather similar. But what they do give you is the moment of conversion, the moment of, of development of what they're going to do, a series of coherent life choices leading up to a, a martyr's death very often. What you don't get in Judaism is any of that. What you get is individualized moments of halakhic decision. And that's because the view of life in the Talmud comes out quite differently. You very rarely get a full sense of a developed life that is lived and explored through narrative. What you get is a set of what it is to be a halachic man, what it is to be faced by a series of decisions each day that will give you a routine, a pattern of your day. And that's what the Talmud is aimed, to aimed at constru uh, construing and putting together. It constructs a different sort of life. In the same way, therefore, that the rabbis are saying the life of a Jew should be different from the life of a Greek. They tell the story of a life differently. That's most evident, and it's been most strongly discussed when you turn to the genre of historiography. Greco-Romans, of course, invented at a certain level historiography. The Bible, on the other hand, also has historical books. Where's the yeah. history in the Talmud? They'll go, the emperor said. Well, which emperor? In a sense, it doesn't matter to the <laughs> rabbis. Oh, it's an emperor. <laughs> you know, they don't care. But you know, if you're a good historiographer, of course you care. And if you want to do what a historical causation you don't do Greco-Roman historical causation. You do 
Jewish historical cause. I realized God did this, or you know, it happened because so and so was invited to a bad was was invited to a party by mistake, got the wrong name, and that would explain the fall of Jerusalem. Yeah. You know, this is not what we would call good Thucydidean history. This is not Tacitus, <laughs> and it's very important. As famously been said, we do memory rather than history. Right. So I was going to ask. So, so in telling such stories, because. They do serve a function within the within the rabbinic corpus. Such sort of story, for example, you're referencing there of Kamsa and Barakamsa or yeah. something like that. So they're not history. What are they? Well, or what can they be seen? They're very strange. It's like if you ask what midrash is in general, is midrash authoritative? Well, sometimes we say. Sometimes it gives you halacha. Sometimes it's just a story. Is it a history? Do we genuinely believe in the rabbis who are so fat that you could drive a truck underneath their bellies when they touched on the street? I mean, I'm not sure we're being encouraged to believe that is a, as well historical truth. We're being encouraged to think of that as, as a, a metaphor, an anecdote, a way of thinking about the world. But it's not a commitment to straightforward truth in that way. And so it's very, very hard for me. And, you know, I've spent quite a few years thinking about it, but I still don't know what is the status of Midrash. When I approach it as a classicist, I know it's not history. I know it's not fable. I know it's not drama or fiction what is it well you are you, you tell me jj i don't know i don't I just know what genre you call it so i just call it midrash and i think it's its own genre and the point that its own genre is really important it's the way in which jews talk to each other the way in which they wrote stories for each other and it was a way also of excluding outsiders and I don't know if you've ever had that experience maybe you haven't had that experience but if you sit with people who aren't jewish and you say oh there's a midrash on this then well, what are you telling me is that true? Is that real? <laughs> yeah. And then you get a, then you get a problem, right? You say, "Well, it sort of is, it sort of isn't." I don't know. So it's an interesting moment. It's an interesting moment, especially because it, it's difficult. You say you're right. It, it does occupy a genre of its own. The problem is that it it crosses the boundaries of of several genres. So there are midrashim where it does seem to be that the rabbis are trying to say a historical point. They are trying to give a piece of data. I mean, the most the most classic example is, is uh, in in Masechet Shabbat. Uh, uh, 22a, um, where it says, asks my Hanukkah, right? What is the story behind Hanukkah? And gives a couple of lines, um, you know, well, the, 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 the you know, burst into the, uh, the uh, courtyard of the, the Ben Bigdash and they purify the oil and the candle lasts for eight days, et cetera, et cetera. And the miracle of the menorah, that does seem to be historical. But there are others, as you mentioned, with the, the rabbis, with the, the, the bellies touching or, um, yeah. you know, uh, or the one in 500 Jews only came out of Egypt or something like that. That does seem to be quite clearly um, something like fable. So it, Midrash is expansive enough to, to flirt with many genres. Let me stop you a little bit and just take you back to the candles. Right? Because there's a very good case where we have, after all, a thoroughly good Greek text which tells us about the, the events. We have Maccabees, which has never become exactly canonical for Jews. And in fact, most Jews have never read it. Uh, any one of the Maccabees. Now, when you do read Maccabees, what is surprising is you find it's a letter addressed to the Jews of Alexandria from Jerusalem saying, we've just had this event and we'd like to tell you what went on so that you can do Hanukkah as well. And it tells the whole story in good historiographical tradition. It's much longer than two lines. And it tells you about the battles and it tells you about who did what and who is in charge and what generals. It's a good piece of military history. And it tells you that when they, when they re- uh, conquered the temple. They had a festival in which they drank wine and ate cheese and nothing whatsoever about a candle and oil. So what's interesting is that you actually have a historical text from close to the period, which tells you nothing about the miracle, which doesn't tell you about latkes, but about cheese and wine. <laughs> and so when Pity you, we, we switched that out, yes. When you talk, I mean, yeah, some of us prefer latkes, some of us prefer cheese and wine. But, <laughs> but when you say it's historical, what I would say is it's a re-mythologization of a history in a very particular way to give us a miracle where there was no miracle in the history. C correct. In, in, in which case, let me let me sharpen what I was saying before is that I don't mean that history is in as in therefore you know the Thucydidean type mm -hmm. of historian ought to accept that as fact, but rather in the sense that at least those couple of lines in the, in the Gemara try to yeah. seem to be providing an account of an event. Yes, they which do. is supposed to be taken place. Yes. What do you do yes. with the occasions that we have many such uh, stories? I mean, of you know, the rabbi who was the great friend of the emperor, and they went in, and the people you know, died. Is that history or not history for you? Is that history or fable? I mean, it's got a historical context, it involves historical characters, 
But it's jolly hard to say, mm, yes, absolutely, that's going to be a piece of history. Right. <laughs> yes, yes. The, 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 which exactly brings us back to our initial problem. It's interesting that you mentioned the, the, the history memory um, mm-hmm. distinction. Uh, this is obviously, uh, fa- obviously for those of us in the field, mm-hmm. uh, famously the grand thesis of a historian from last century, Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. I don't know if you... Yes, of course, uh, that's what I was referring to. Yes, yes, that. Right, that's right. Yeah, yes. So... <laughs> I, I, did you ever meet him? Did you ever? Oh, uh, no, have contact with him? not. No, no, no. no, no. Okay, okay. Um, I, I'm too young, but uh, you know. So, I, I hope so, I am too, but I... <laughs> yeah, well, uh, no comment. Um, but, um, but, but, but the major thesis that he has, at least about rabbinic history, is a very interesting one, where he says that essentially the reason the rabbis didn't write history, didn't go into the genre of history, is because they inherited a template from the Hebrew Bible, um, which essentially said that you know um, when the Jews are you know, when the Israelites or the Jews behave well, so God rewards them, uh, has them in the land and makes them prosper. And when they behave poorly, when they sin, so then they are exiled and they they suffer. And therefore, according to Yerushalmi, there is no history in rabbinic literature because they view all events as essentially replaying the same theme, right? It is just more examples of the Jews uh, uh, receiving punishment, receiving various forms of of oppression and and difficulty in their lives because they have sinned, because they have displeased or angered God. Um, is this satisfactory to you? Is the reason mm. the rabbis don't engage in the writing of actual history? I mean, do you buy that, essentially? Um, I think I want to at very least to nuance it quite significantly and in two directions. The first is, okay. I'm not sure that accounts adequately for the historical books of the Bible. It's much better, obviously, on, on the Pentateuch than it is on the later books, where yeah. sometimes we seem to get something that looks a bit more like history when we get down to the books of the you know, kings and so forth. But the other side of it is it, it does rather depend on the rabbis looking back straightforwardly to the Torah, to the to the to the to the Humash, if you like. And that has to leave out quite a lot of stuff in between. It's as if there'd been no Jews between the composition of the Book of Kings and the rabbis in the fourth century. Now, we in that period we have the whole of Hellenistic Judaism and we have alternatives. We have Josephus. We have a Jew who knows how to write Greek history and who knows how to write the sack of the temple in Greek historical terms. And he can do that and does that. And we have the Jewish, uh, we have, we have the Jewish war, the long Greek history of a major event in Jewish history. We also have Jewish antiquities, which is a, you know, an attempt to explain Jewish culture of the Romans. So it's not as though we didn't have Jews who knew how to do it. So in a sense, to uh, essentialize you know, the Jewish view, is to allow the rabbis to have won the game on that particular one, where in fact what they're doing is making a very, very particular selection against Josephus and against the Maccabees and against Hellenistic Judaism. And I think that's an important thing to remember, that you make choices when you write. And, uh, I mean, so, so, so I, this, I almost uh, hesitate to ask this question, but, but essentially why? Why would it have been so important? the rabbis to reject this overarching Greek way of, let's say, doing history or, 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 uh, or any kind of other science or any kind of other, um, um, uh, or, or the import, importing Greek elements into their own uh, literature. Um, was it simply the military defeat that they had suffered so grievously from the hands of the Romans? Was it, did they see Hellenistic culture as you know, mm. antagonistic towards their own? I mean, what, what, what were the motivations lying behind this? Well, I think both of those are absolutely primary. So you've got to remember that Judea was destroyed by the, the Romans at that point. Thousands were taken into slavery off to Rome. And the Arch of Titus is you know, one lasting symbol of that particular event. And uh, it was absolutely devastating. It's quite hard to imagine now how devastating that was to a culture. But as some Jews did stay and did try and reconstruct a world slowly, indeed, they had a question about what that world was going to look like. Uh, they came from a place where uh, Jews were thoroughly Hellenized. You know, Shia Cohen from Harvard <laughs> says, you know, there are no Jews that were not Hellenized in the in the in, in the Second Temple period. That's just what he is to be living in this period. And the reason why we say that is not to be provocative, but to be culturally accurate about the dominance of Greek culture. As I said, for someone like Julius Caesar, it was normal to speak Greek in private with his friends, even if he wrote in Latin, in the same way as it was normal for Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor, the Roman emperor, to write his books in Greek. You know, can you imagine the what it would be like for an American president to write his, his memories in French? We know that's not going to happen. Right? 
<laughs> God, as you say, God forbid. <laughs> be another, there'd be another revolution this time. We yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. But so the point is that Greek culture was dominant. It wasn't only dominant linguistically. So that if you go to Betshean, you'll see inscriptions on the wall and cemeteries of Greek and plenty of Greek inscription, where you clear the Jews right up into that period of writing Greek, thinking in Greek and using Greek echoes. But it's also the culture. What did your house look like? Your house looked Greek. And we've got all those mosaics that are going around in, in, in Israel. <laughs> we've got Dionysus. You've got fruit going on the floor. These aren't weird and wacky Jews. These are wealthy elite Jews. That's why we. That's why they've got the, the stuff on the floor in the first place. And they're speaking Greek. They know Greek culture. And they're living Greek. We've got the rabbi in the bathhouse. We know the rabbis are going to the bathhouse. When question, he says, like, I'm going to her. She's not coming to mine. I'm, you know, she's, <laughs> there's, the we have, there's a way of disavowing what you're doing. But we know that rabbis were going to the bathhouse. They were taking off their clothes with Romans and sitting in the water and having a good time like everybody else. Right? So... The dominance of culture is really, really hard to imagine. So if you want to create your own cult, shall we say, your own group, your own clique, your own insider group, how do you do it? Well, you do it by language and you do it by culture. And so getting people to speak Hebrew, getting people to speak Aramaic first and as a dominant language and moving into Hebrew as an intellectual language is a very important part of what you might do, getting people to read Hebrew creating new ways of responding to the world so that study starts to become an important part rather than temple worship, which, of course, is impossible. Um, not thought to be impossible till quite late. After all, Julian is still in the, in the, in the, in the fourth century. Is trying to, is, is promises to reconstruct the, the temple. Right? So as late as that, we're still thinking of reinscribing temple culture, which is not going to happen uh, in the ancient world. Um, and so gradually people are putting together that space and saying, well, what would our culture look like in this group? And small groups of uh, 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 students of the rabbis start to try and live that rabbinical life. And to do that, you have to put a pretty strong set of boundaries in because the, because otherwise everything is so porous. It's so precarious. You know, um, and so I don't know. It was interesting. The. Uh, my wife's grandfather, the great Rabbi Pinchas Taitz, when I first met him, he said, oh, you're a Greek scholar. I thought, oh, no, you know, from Rabbi Taitz. <laughs> <laughs> Grandson-in-law is a Greek scholar. He said, he said to me immediately, he said, you know, there's almost no page of Talmud without a Greek word on it. Interesting. And that's an interesting thought to think about how embedded even so Greek is in, in, the, in the Jewish writing. And, and even if, and this is, this is interesting because, yeah, this does seem to be the case that Greek is very firmly embedded in the Talmud, even though theoretically the Talmud is written um, in a different place. It's written in Persia and several yeah. centuries well, later. Well, the, the Babylonian Talmud is. Uh, Babylonian Talmud, yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. Closer yeah. 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 Correct, correct. Well, you know, so we've got a possibility there. But even so, these are people who are traveling between these places. I mean, right. The scholars are traveling. We know there's a pretty, particularly good set of uh, circulation routes uh, be between Alexandria and Babylon and, and Jerusalem and those sort of places. So I think it's a, it's a multicultural norm. Um, one should remember that most of the world is bilingual, not monolingual. Yeah. It's, you know, it's only in America that everybody's monolingual, and even then they're not. <laughs> right? Even then there are lots who aren't, you know. Yes. You know? Uh, but the idea and, that monolingualism is an ideal is a ludicrous one. Most of the world is happily bilingual, and, and many Jews were, and many Jews have been throughout the world. That's been part of the problem yes. in the 19th century when people fantasized about the purity of culture, which the Jews stood against. It was because Jews spoke too many languages as well as everything else that put them yes. to one side. This, I mean, I have to say, I don't think we British can be um, entirely yeah. absolved on the monolingual side. No, 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 no. I'd say speak it loud and speak it often. That's all we can do. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, I, I wanted to ask actually about another element of, of this sort of Greek <laughs> aspect uh, in the Talmud that you've written about, which is the element of mockery. Yes. Um, and, and this is very interesting to me, especially for, uh, you know, the representatives of a people who had been thoroughly trounced in a few major wars yeah. and who felt, as you say, the encroachment of a dominant culture. Mm. Um, there, again, according to, to you, there are elements within the Talmud that, that show a, a subtle uh, mockery on the part of the rabbis of uh, sure. you know, Greek or Roman uh, yeah. figures or stories. Or Can you perhaps elaborate a little on this? Yeah, sure. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> I'm going to tell you a story, first of all, that... Uh, Danny Boyarin told me about Sol Lieberman, who was his teacher. So it uh, so goes back. This is one of those rabbinical stories that goes back from teacher to teacher to teacher. He said, to understand the Talmud, you should read Lucian. Now, Lucian is a second century Syrian Greek satirist. 
He writes about religion and writes about uh, commitments to cults in very, very funny ways. Why did he say that? I think he said that because I think he understood that there is a lot of humor in the Talmud. And that sometimes gets forgotten, partly because we're terribly serious as Jews. And you know, I say, why should we not? I mean, what happened to Jewish humor? I mean, come on, we know there's tons of jokes in the Talmud. The question is, sometimes people are too nervous to laugh about them. <laughs> and one of the most obvious places in Midrashim about emperors, some of them are, are terrifying. So they're sort of terrifying black humor. So there's the story of Hadrian who is standing, and a Jew comes past and the Jew doesn't welcome him, doesn't salute him. And he instructs his men to kill that Jew for not saluting him. And then another Jew comes along and salutes him loudly. And he says, how dare you? And he says to his men, kill him. And they say, well, how could you kill Jews for both saluting and not saluting? And the emperor says, I do what I like. Right. Right? And that's, is that a funny story? No, it's a horrific story. But you can see it has the structure of a joke. It has the structure of you can't win against this lot. It, but it's about as dark a humor as you can get. Yeah, That's about as dark as you get. Right? There, and there are many jokes from the Holocaust that come out like that. Yes. So, yeah, there are many Holocaust jokes that follow that line. You're, 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 which, which Jews tell and retell. Jews tell, absolutely. You'll, 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 you'll know the one about the, the German who, who gives two pieces of paper to the Jew. It says, one says life and one says death. He says, of course, the Jew suspects they both say death. So he puts one in his mouth quickly. And the guy says, what have you done? He says, well, the other one will tell you what I've just chosen. <laughs> so, again, similar sort of black humor. How do you get out of the impossible choice? Oh, that's right. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's the sort of thing yeah. I shouldn't laugh at, but I did. Yes. No, okay, absolutely. Right. And so, but there are plenty of jokes in which you get the wise kid, the wise Alec child who defeats a Greek philosopher. So the guy, you know, a Greek philosopher comes to town, to Jerusalem, and says to a child, Here's a certain amount of money. Please go and buy me something which I can uh, still have something left at the end of the day. So the guy comes back with a pound of salt. He said, Well, you said you want something you could eat and still have something left. <laughs> <laughs> but no food, right? And so, <laughs> those sort of, you know, are they hilarious jokes to us? Perhaps not. But they are clearly designed to be the laughter of the oppressed. The idea that when you are oppressed, if you can imagine getting one over on your bosses, getting one over on, it's a very familiar, you know, laughter from below sort of thing. And those midrashim, there are quite a lot of them, uh, and some of them are in strange places, you know, like Eicha or whatever. You know, you'll see it in midrash Rabbi Eicha. And so I, I find that quite interesting that we can, even in the past, as we do in the present, discover that sense that one of the ways you treat the awfulness of things is to find some sort of humor as a way of treating with it, because it's a way you can put the other down in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. You also. Uh... Talk a bit about the the famous midrash um, about the death of Emperor Titus with the flea or the gnat, yeah, uh, which, yeah. which according to the story of the Talmud, I'll, I'll say very briefly, if I remember yeah. correctly, which is that uh, you know Emperor Titus, so he um, you know obviously has just destroyed uh, the temple and he was responsible yeah. for um, yeah you know untold amount of death and, and destruction uh, in yeah. Judea, um, and then how he dies is according to midrash is that a flea or a gnat, a tiny insect, yeah. burrows up his nose into his yeah. brain. Yeah. Um, and and causes a buzzing that is is uh, unbearable to him, yeah. and then he comes across a blacksmithing, uh, yeah. so, so someone banging on metal, and that provides yeah. him some sort of relief and so from the buzzing in his head. So he yeah. uh, has uh, the person do that all the time, and then eventually, you know, it, it gets so bad that he demands, I think, some sort of surgery, yeah. and they crack open his skull, and the, the gnat flies out, and he so dies. Eyes of a small bird, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, so in, in your eyes, I mean, what kind of genre is that? What kind of how does one read a story like that? Is yeah. it is it meant to be absurd? Is it meant to be you know, well, it, gloating? It's One thing that's quite interesting is the story specifies that the rabbi the rabbi was there at the point of the operation. So he saw it. Yes. So it's giving you this where the apparatus of a historical tale as if it's true. Right? Now, we do sort of know from historical sources that's not how Titus died. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it would be unwise just to turn around and go, well, it's in the first. that must be true, right? It's not true, of course, it's not true in, in any sort of naive historical sense. What it is, is a story of unremitting and delighted revenge. I can't read it any other way. It's a way of saying, do you know what? He may be the greatest in the world. 
He may have you know, the head man of the biggest empire the world has ever known, but you know what can destroy him? The tiniest thing, if God is behind it. So that idea of scale is absolutely crucial to the story. And you know, scale is often very important to humor and to the way uh, normative stories, the way moral stories are developed. Um, is there a moral to the story? I think the moral of the story is that you know your punishment can be worse than anything you can imagine. It can drive you mad, <laughs> All right? which is quite a good one. And also that the ones who are little may yet turn out to be effective in the world. And that's a message for the idler who has survived the, <laughs> the destruction of Judea. <laughs> so, I, mean, I can't read it any other way. I mean, I'm not going to suggest that it's trying to construct, as it were, a new historical narrative for Rome or whatever. Right. I think it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of fable, I suppose, in that case. It's yeah, you're fable. certainly not the first to, to say this, because um, actually the very first Jewish work that exhibits some, in the modern period, that exhibits some kind of, let's say, historical uh, um, sensibility is Azaria de Rossi's um, Ore Naim. Um, and it's uh, and essentially most it, it it does provide some sort of history of, of Judaism. Most of it is taken fairly uncritically from from the Talmud and from the uh, from the Bible. However, he picks upon this story because he's literate in Latin sources. He picks upon this story and says, "This this can't be the way Titus died. This can't be. Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. This must be something else." But but yes, as you say, it tries to give over some sort of a uh, sort of message. I, do, do, do you want to? Uh... No, no, that's that's absolutely right. I, yeah. So I think so. What's interesting is that we we never get rid of those stories. The other thing is that it's interesting that the editorial process of the Talmud keeps those stories in. And it's interesting to ask why. It's not for children, as people you know. These are these are for people to read. You know, it's and it's interesting to think about why why we include in the Talmud contradictory stories, stories that disagree with each other, and stories that you can't believe. There's a lot of challenge in the Talmud to your sense of how the world is. And that challenge is, is something that you rarely see in educational texts or in normative texts of, of that period or any other. I mean, you know, when you read Aristotle, you don't get stories like that. And I think that's also important. No, you don't. However, and th this is a neat segue into the next thing I wanted to ask you, because it mm. seems to me that um, one could perhaps see in the Talmud echoes, let's say, of pl platonic dialogue. In other words, that the way that truth is reached is through mm. having great figures hash things out, you know, back and forth repeatedly mm. until you have, um, until you maybe reach some sort of resolution, maybe. Um, sure. Is this, is this correct? I mean, can yeah. this be seen to be a Greek uh, influence in some discussion? Yes. Yeah, so, well, I mean, the most obvious place to go to get an answer is not the Talmud, but, but uh, the Seder. To go to Seder night and the Haggadah. Yeah. Which is, uh, you know, this is not news to say, though many people would be upset to hear it still, is that it's completely formulated around the Greek symposium as a model. Not just casually in terms of lying down like a free man, but the idea that you have a number of drinks that you should have, that it's formed on a question and answer basis, that you end up with singing songs, that you don't go out partying afterwards. There are all sorts of ways in which this is very carefully planned around the Greek symposium. And that's because that's what you did in that culture. In that period, all the way through, we're talking whenever you think the first said of Imar, but I mean, after the destruction of the temple, obviously. But, you know, in the first two, three, four centuries, people, if they want to celebrate, they're going to celebrate in a Greek way. And uh, they want to put together, um, uh, um, uh, I don't know, a model of life still that apes the Greeks. Um, I'd forgotten why, why you asked the question. Now I got lost in my own answer. Oh, in terms of Greek, Gosh. Greek answering, in terms of uh, so the questions. Yes, and, because, yeah, because you it's mentioned it's the idea of platonic dialogue. Yeah. So I would say it's, it's slightly different. It's not just platonic dialogue. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's a fascinating moment in Philo um, when he's telling, which is you know a first century Jew writing in Greek in Alexandria, and when he wants to tell the story of Joseph in the pit and when joseph is pulled out of the pit and taken off and uh, and is it reuben who comes back and says where is the boy in in, in the torah in the greek he does a long speech because in greek you always do long speeches you never say single sentence. <laughs> so he does a long a waste speech. of an opportunity if it's <laughs> absolutely it, he says is it better for this is it better for that can i tell my father can i do this but what's so funny is that he actually quotes plato so i love the idea of reuben quoting plato in the midst of a discussion about Joseph, right? So and, that's and, and that's what Philo puts in the mouth of Reuben. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. So you can see there. You can hilarious. see that Plato has become part of the Jewish tradition at that point.
you know. But the, the question and answer format is something that we see throughout the symposium as a model. So the idea that you would sit at a party and you're sitting around the table, there's three to a couch, you're drinking your glass of wine, and somebody says, why do we have parsley at the beginning of a meal? And then, then you'll get answers, and you'll get four or five answers. And, and we have those texts written down. So you can read the sympotic questions of, of, of Plutarch, which is you have Greek questions, you have Roman questions, and the lost barbarian questions. So there's that modeling that comes all the way through into Jewish culture from the Greek or alongside the Greek, which is just normal for the period, normal for what you do if you're an elite guy. That's one of the ways you have fun at dinner. You know, it's right. rather die down now, I suppose. <laughs> Except it's a... <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, right, exactly. Say it as one of the few and, uh, you know, some yeah. very good Friday night dinners, perhaps. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. If we can talk for a moment, it, does this extend into theology? Is something I'm curious about. Um, in the sense that you have... Um, you know, obviously one of the great struggles within rabbinic literature against the outsider is on a religious basis. The rabbis simply have, they are inheritors of a very different religious tradition, uh, have very different religious beliefs. Um, is, there, is there evidence of, let's say, a struggle against, uh, or not even a struggle against, but, but ways in which the rabbis attempt to, to oppose or undermine the religious framework that they see in the culture surrounding them? Again, can you speak to that? Um. The first thing to say is that henotheism or monotheism, the idea there is one God, was a view that you can find in quite a lot of heavy-duty philosophical theology that is not Jewish in that period. So Neoplatonism and other branches that relate to Neoplatonism will say there is one God and his name of God is mind and or Sophia or wisdom or whatever. And that feeds off again in, 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 into other areas of Judaism that we probably won't talk about. But there is that. But I think the area where you see the most difficult conflict, the most immediate area, is around the idea of creation. Um, that is to say that a material philosophy cannot create something out of nothing. And it's quite important that most Greek philosophy will not tell a story of creation. It will say things exist, and they always have existed and will exist. And there is no originary point uh, before which there is whatever you think there is before. And when you read the commentary, I mean, I suppose Rashi is a bit late for what we're talking about. But as it were, the idea of what you would say on Bereshit 1.1 would be, you mustn't look before this. If you look before this, you're doing something wrong. And to call it a heresy, as it gets called at various points, in the Mishnah and Chagiga, right? Anyone who asks what is above, what is below, what is before, and what is after, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so well, we know, the heretic. we know perfectly well that there are people who are asking this question. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't need to say that. And the difficulty is that it's actually philosophically rather hard to imagine a moment of creation out of nothing. And, um, you know, so if you go to the fourth century, it's rather wonderful. I mean, the person I enjoy reading most on this is actually Augustine writing in Latin, a very heavy duty Christian theologian. And he says God is outside time. God must be outside time because God is eternal or whatever. It doesn't exist in time. So how could God say let there be light? Because to say let there be light means that it takes time to say. You know, let. It is a, it takes time. Language takes time to express. So you couldn't possibly say let there be light as if it was a call from heaven. as a voice from heaven. right? God's language is always already spoken. And you can only hear it silently, inwardly. Now, that's a, a reflection on the idea of creation that is trying to take seriously the idea that there's an eternal God. And what do we think? How can we imagine a temporality for God and yet humans being necessarily temporal? And there's a very serious reflective move. And I think you don't get as much as that in Judaism. I think there's more of a let's just not talk about that in some ways. At least. And that's, a, a, that's quite an interesting resistance because I think it would get you into some quite interesting theology. So, so this is a question I've posed before uh, to others actually on this podcast, but th something very um, germane to this is exactly what you mentioned, which is that we don't see systematic theology among Chazal like you do in uh, Aquinas and uh, sorry uh, with Augustine and like you do with um, you know uh, the Neoplatonic philosophers of the time. And and the, there seems to be one of two ways of, of understanding why this is the case. One is that it, it they it was it was obvious, meaning things were decided; they didn't need to elaborate on it too much because they were heirs of a 
an already formed religion or uh, religious theology, uh, and therefore, what is the point of discussing it? Well, that can't it? be true. Okay, that can't be true, right? In the sense that you cannot go through, you know, five hundred years in which the middle point is the destruction of the temple and a complete, complete redesign of Jewish life and say, oh, there's consistent theology, must be consistent theology. That must be a fantasy. And we have no evidence for it, right? I mean, we have no evidence for it. So then the other side, as I was, I was going to say, the other horn of the dilemma is the, is the precise opposite, which is that, um, you know, that there is, in fact, maybe, a, a, how do you say, sort of a, a, a range, a spectrum of possible, a, a sort of... Um, various systems of theology within which rabbinic thought was developed and therefore they didn't want to they didn't want to systematize it too precisely for fear of let's say alienating too many or or trying to pin down these sorts of things precisely when they actually very much wanted a kind of uh, an alive and um, malleable world of theological propositions well i think i would put it in slightly different ways i would say that there is a, a the most consistent thing in the talmud is that you should live your life as a series of halakhic decisions, that you make decisions at a point about what you're going to do. You don't make a decision to say, I, in 20 years' time, I'm going to have made this much money and I'm going to retire. <laughs> that sort of consistency does not appear in the Talmud, as far as I'm aware. And I, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to read into that any kind of autobiographical uh, no, 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 no. on your part. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Of course, nor for my children, nor for my grandchildren. <laughs> but um, and of course, you know, if somebody comes to you and tells you that the Messiah has come and you're planting a tree, you should finish planting the tree before you go check. It says that. That's fine. Okay, That's a perfectly good thing. So we have a long-term history in that way. But what we don't have is a, is a sense of a systematic life. We have a sense of systematic halakha. Now, how systematic is it? Well, it's very fragmented in the Talmud. And it's really only when you get to, to Rambam that we get systematicity in that. And, of course, there was opposition to that in time. <laughs> so uh, when it ends up with systematicity going towards Aristotle, you can see the implications that systematicity leads you to a particular place. And Aristotle might be that place. Right? And, now, and you think the rabbis were consciously trying to avoid this? I think there's a way in which... Did not want systematicity. Well, there's not only that systematicity, because the other systematicity of deep theology in which they're living is Christianity which is, of course, should be thought of always as Christianity's violent disagreements, huge arguments over ma matters of dogma, which Judaism has never got into uh, in most ways. I mean, modernity is slightly more complicated. We start to get principles of faith and people start rather foolishly killing themselves over it or killing each other over it. But actually, we don't get very many signs in early Judaism of people doing that. But we do in Christianity. I mean, it's quite quick after Christianity comes to be that Christian emperors start putting Christians to death for having wrong views. So there is a real danger in systematicity, which is totalitarian thought, that one has to look for. And indeed, you see that in modern Judaism now, that when people think they have all the answers and it's a systematic thought, you see what's happening. Well, you can make your own conclusions of what I think about the current state of affairs. Right, <laughs> yes, uh, which I shan't uh, uh, state out loud. But but this is very interesting because then that leads us back to what we were discussing in the beginning, which is perhaps this explains the development of something like Midrash. It mm -hmm. is a way of conveying, uh, let's say, information or, or values or uh, propositions about, you know, correct propositions about the religion they're trying to adhere to without stating it in such a categorical manner as can be, um, you know, divisive or, or that you can burn someone at the stake for, 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 for disagreeing. You, one can't really disagree with a Midrash. That's not the mode in which one... Well, what is a Midrash for? You should always ask, not does one thing mean, what does it do? Now, what does a Midrash do? And let me try this on you, that the point of Midrash is to be disruptive. That you tell a Midrash to somebody, you're having a conversation, somebody says, I think X, and you go, let me tell you a story. Yeah, that's what Midrash... Yeah? So the Midrash, although we've written them down, they're designed to be disruptive. And I think that's quite an important way of thinking about them that they're actually, they are the opposite of ritual. That's to say, rituals insist that everything's in place, everything's in order, and we do ritual the same way, and we can discuss how to do ritual the same way. And we say, do it this way, do it that. What are we going to do with this pot? Is this pot kosher or is it not kosher? Midrash isn't like that. You tell me a midrash, I, you, you tell me a midrash, I'll tell you a midrash. <laughs> they're going to be a swap. They're, always, they're, sort of, they're disruptive, they're circulating, 
but they're not fixed. In that, even though the text may be fixed, but they're not fixed in their authority or in what they tell you. Midrashim can be reread. And it seems to me one of the things that's typical of Judaism and sometimes forgotten is that we have the Mishnah, which does look like at many places like a law code. And the Mishnah is much closer to what we might have in antiquity as you know, a foundational law code. But what we do immediately is start saying, no, hang on, <laughs> let's add all these comments, all this discussion, all these stories, and then you'll, you'll never believe that Mishnah anyway. That Mishnah is going to be so hard to follow. <laughs> so you've, got to, you've got to read all this before you can get back to that. And, and that's, that's the Talmud, essentially. That's the Talmud. So yeah. again, it's a way of both being disruptive to its own law, but also creating the world into which you must step. And once you've stepped into it, it's very hard to get out of it. And that's yeah. part of the point of it, is creating as as, as as all literate Jews discover. Very yeah, hard. Exactly. To, you, can, uh, you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. That's right. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. But, um, so, but, uh, and of course, something like Midrash being endlessly open-ended in that sense, yeah. it, it, it can always be added to, can always be augmented in that sense. And is this what you mean? Because um, you, you also wrote that the ways in which the, the, the rabbinic... Um, rabbinic literature is formulated to be, again, um, resistant to, in some ways, Greek and, and Roman uh, uh, literature. Um, and it creates a different version of the self or a different sense of the self. Is, is this what you were referring to? The sort of... Yeah. Uh, how exactly yeah. do you explain well, that? I think that, I mean, it's very hard to talk about such grand terms as the self. But one has to have a go at doing it because I think it's quite important. And I think that there is a different sense of what education is. They're interrelated, but they're different. There's a different sense of how you might fit into a culture in, in, in these ways. A different, if you like, I suppose, basically a different sense of how you represent yourself to yourself. That's what I'm how do you know who you are? How do you know what you're doing? And you know, as, as we know, one of the biggest differences is if, if you meet a Christian, they'll say, what do you believe? All right? If you meet a Jew, they'll say, what do you do? They won't say, what do you do? They'll say, you know, can you eat in my house? You know, <laughs> what's the <laughs> yeah, They'll say, yeah, where did you study? They're not going to say, what do you believe? All right? And that's a very big difference about how you understand yourself. And I think the rabbis were interested in constructing that different sense of self, both from Christians and from Greek and Romans. It's triangulated, not just opposed. And of course, the, the Christians are also trying to distinguish themselves from Greeks and Romans and Jews at the same time. So it's going around in a sort of dynamic of religious interaction, everybody claiming purity, but everybody in direct relation to one another, <laughs> fighting about, about you know, the, the boundaries of their own, their, own, their own groups. And that's what's going on uh, in this period, I think, for a very long time, and perhaps still is. Um, so it's that sort of sense of how do you understand what it is to be you in your society, in your group? And that isn't, you know, you can recognize what other people do being different, different. And that's one of the ways you know who you are. You know, you're, a, hmm. does that make sense? Uh, at all? Yeah, know. it does. And I suppose, I suppose your, your the sort of claim underneath your claim would be that to read and reread and comment upon rabbinic literature, formulate a different kind of self. Then yeah. one would get reading, yes. let's say, Aristotle, Thucydides, yeah. etc. Sure, sure. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, um, Americans are always very surprised, if I can say this to you, um, uh, in your sort of double life at the moment. No, please, uh, yes. I'm sure <laughs> it, to say, you know, the standard questions that I hear all the time are, you know, what school did you go to? What college did you go to? And by college, they mean which college at Oslo, Cambridge. <laughs> <laughs> and those are the sort of questions which you say, because that's the cursor sonorum, that's the career path of an upper class Englishman or a middle class Englishman, is to go to a good school and then go to Cambridge and then go off and join be a bank or to the you know, things we resist. You know, and so those are the questions that make sense of a life. They're not the questions you would ask necessarily if you were if you met another Jew. I mean you might, but you might not. You know, and that's the sense you there'd be a different set of questions. And it's that way in which how do I how do I place you? How do yeah, you know, we always say when we meet, we play Jewish geography. Well, how did the ancients play Jewish geography? That's one of the things I say. They didn't say, Do you know the cousin of so-and-so? That's not what they did. There's a bit of that. But they're gonna say, you know, what, what do you do? Do you where do you live? You know, do you do you have a rabbi? Do you do you do rabbis? Do you do rabbis? Or are you actually Greek? You know, do you live in Caesarea or not? And if you live in Caesarea, who do you talk to in Caesarea? Do you talk to the Christians? Do you talk to the Greeks? You know, those are the questions that people are asking. You know, so 
Don't think about that. Don't think about the guys in season eight. Just change it. That's what you do. You know, that's how you're going to work out who you are. Mm. fascinating to imagine um, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay I we, we okay. sort of uh, we just want to say one thing one thing Go ahead. I'm making is that most religions and Judaism is certainly not unique amongst this have a commitment to their own sense of purity and what I'm trying to put back onto the map is the sense of not dirtiness but the sense of hybridity and mix that was actually the situation in which people lived when they were constantly calibrating their lives in and amongst other sorts of people and that there's a dynamic of religious interaction between christians who are really started off as jews and became something else and jews some of whom had to resist christianity to, and both of them trying to discover themselves against greek and roman and that sort of messy interaction goes on for hundreds of years uh, and We've never escaped from it in some ways. And so right. Are you this, still this, what we have is the purity of the Jewish religion. <laughs> the, most, the least, the least, the least comprehend, the, one, the, the, the view that will least comprehend antiquity. Put it like that. Right, yes. Exactly. And, and the, the construction of the self in that sense. Um, I, I wanted to jump forward about uh, 18 centuries uh, very briefly to the, uh, to the modern period. Just one or two quick questions. The first one is, uh, on the heels of something we mentioned before about about Jews and their construction of history and the lack of con uh, historical writing within uh, within Chazal within the, the writings of the rabbis, which is that at some point Jews do return to writing history, uh, specifically in the middle of the nineteenth century, uh, several German historians and others, um, and this has often been seen in the context of a rebellion against the rabbinic uh, well, um, way of thinking. And... Haskalah would be well, the... yes, sort of yeah. correct. The Haskalah, but the Haskalah already. That's kind of had already been in motion for uh, 40 or 50 years or so. Uh, but the, the, the Jewish historical turn takes place in the 1840s, 1850s, 1860s. And, and, and again, do you, do you see this as, as many have, as a rebellion against the rabbinic way of writing and thinking? Or, or put it another way, is it necessary to, re to reject rabbinic way of seeing the past and rabbinic ways of writing in order to, yeah. to, to go about the sort of quote-unquote Greek way of, of writing, Greek way of conceiving yeah. the past, namely writing actual history? Yeah, well, it's uh, uh, I've written quite a lot about this elsewhere. And the, um, I think it's from that. Part of it is to do with there are a lot of German history. I mean, history becomes a dominant mode in the 19th century. It becomes a big way of talking about the world. And a series of very important historians, fascinated in particular by their Christian origins, were constantly writing about the early days of Jesus, which meant they had to write about the history of, uh, of Judaism. And what was fascinating is that when people wrote the history of Judaism, as Heinrich Ewald did, it stopped with the apostles. Largely. So, you know, 14 volumes of history, of which the last you know, 10 pages covered sort of 70 to today, you know, the rest. Of, and they were quite explicit about saying that, that Judaism was a dead subject. It was a dead, dead end. It was nothing happened because of Christianity. And so Jews, started, the approach. Jews started to write back against that in Germany and then got picked up in England by some Christians and by some Jews. So it became a very hot topic because it was about the beginnings of Judaism. And what's interesting is that you had both Orthodox and non-Orthodox responses at that point. So, um, you know, Heschel, when he writes, is going to write um, uh, reform version, as it were. But when you've got other Jews writing Philip's son and others, they're, they're coming out of an Orthodox background and training. And the, and the Wissenschaft des Judentums, the, the, you know, the, the, the scholarship on, on ancient Judaism, was a, a new school in Germany. And what it was was some of it was quite Orthodox people and some of it was not. Um, but they were fully embracing Enlightenment values back to Moses Mendelssohn, even when they were Orthodox. But what they were, what was at stake was, can you tell the story of the Jews in a way that the Germans can hear? And it turned out that the answer was undoubtedly no. <laughs> so, well, well, it's easy for us to say that two centuries later. Yes, but they they yes, genuinely thought you could. That. They yes. thought they could and they tried exactly. very, very hard. Mm. Right. That's fair enough. Uh, w one final question, um, which again relates to the 19th or 20th century, uh, because one of the things that the, when you write about um, the literature of Chazal within the context of the classical period, you've um, you point a little bit of an accusatory finger at fellow classicists for ignoring uh, mm. the writings of uh, of the rabbis in this sense. They haven't treated it as a major corpus of text within the classical period. Um, 
why what why is this what has stopped them from doing so both i suppose at the beginning of the scholarship of the 19th century but also till today it, it seems to not have really penetrated in the way it ought to but the 19th century was it was actually better the 19th century people studied hebrew and they studied even in some cases the talmud because they knew that it was going to tell them about christianity so they were happy to do that they wanted to understand the background and do that material but um after the first world war in particular People separated out the Jewish side of things from the Greek and Roman. They're, they're developed from the 1790s onwards, really, uh, slowly, a deep belief in the, the, the value that counted in Greekness was purity, that you look for pure Hellenism. And so classics was really the 5th century BCE, and they didn't even want to read the Greek of the 2nd century or the 3rd century, because that was already somehow degraded. And so when you were seek, seeking to find your purity, the one thing you didn't want is Jews either in the literature or in the institutions. And of course, Jews were kept out of most of the scholarly institutions for a long time in the 19th century. So um, what I find particularly odd now is that there's a move to talk about widening the uh, purview of classics away from just Greek and Latin and remembering the whole of the ancient Mediterranean. And I'm sort of saying, well, we've always been here, guys. <laughs> you, don't have to, you know, you've ignored us all this time. We, well, stop pretending this is trendy to do Talmud. We've been doing this for a while. But they don't usually mean Talmud. They usually mean Persian or, you know, Indic or, or sort of Sanskrit languages, uh, languages of some sort, where, in fact, Judaism is the one that's actually interacting. The second thing I find odd is people want to write history from below. They say, oh, we've been writing about the Roman Empire, the dominant forces for so long. What about the forces that were being oppressed? How can we understand that? I said, well, you've got Avodah Zarah. Go read Avodah Zarah. It's a whole story about what it's like to be faced by another religion, another place, and how you deal with that. And so for me, it's a sort of a mild irony of history that people are so self so unaware of their self-positioning that they think it's uh, that they're, they're struggling to find something that's right in front of their noses. And so if you wanted to write about hybridization and purity, if you wanted to write about religion from below, if you wanted to write about the differences within the Roman Empire, if you wanted to write about why Greek and Latin are not the only languages in the Mediterranean, well, I know where I'd go. And I can't see why other people don't understand that. <laughs> so. You know, so firstly, that, that's very encouraging to a, a young aspiring academic like myself, that, yeah. that's, you know. The, yeah. the, the Jewish view seems to be up on, you know, or, or could potentially slide into the trendy, um, you know, the trendy ways that, that, that academia is going. Okay, I, I, I really could, uh, you know, we could talk about this for far longer. But I think we'll have to draw close for today. Uh, Professor Simon Goldhill, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast of Jewish Ideas. Thank you. I've enjoyed myself very much. Thank you. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimmich edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate.